So this video is on hernias and diverticulum. I like to link them together because they're both kind of associated with straining. And so hernias, we're going to talk about first. Hernia is whenever some sort of organ goes through a defect, a weakness, a hole, protrudes where it shouldn't. Because we're talking about GIT, we're going to talk about the abdominal organs protruding through some sort of defect, some sort of hole, some sort of weakness. So hernia, and it'll protrude through this weakness. And you can sometimes see it. It'll be a little bulge, right? See, it's a little bulge. And sometimes you can push it back in, sometimes reduce it. And we call those reducible hernias. So reducible equals push back in. However, sometimes you can't push it back in. Sometimes it gets stuck and you'll see this bulge and you try and push it back in and it won't go. And we call that incarcerated. Kind of like if a person's incarcerated, they're like stuck in jail, they're stuck. So if a hernia is stuck, we call that incarcerated. Incarcerated equals stuck. And then last but not least, if your hernia is stuck, if that bulge is stuck, then you can sometimes squeeze on it. Squeeze it so much it starts to lose blood. It starts to lose its blood supply. We call that strangulation, kind of like you're strangling something. It's strangled. So a strangulated hernia equals no blood supply. Strangulated equals no blood supply. And you can tell a hernia is strangulated because it'll talk about a bulge that's not bothering the patient. Then all of a sudden it starts to turn color, turn black, turn blue. It starts to hurt really bad. That's strangulated hernia. So very easy to pick up on the question stem. Now, where do you get hernias in the first place? Where are these weaknesses? Where are these holes that your abdominal content can bulge through? Now, if I, if I just close my eyes and I try to think of the abdominal cavity, or abdominal cavity, trying to think of any openings, any holes, any canals where abdominal content can go through, I can think of, how about your top surface? How about your diaphragm? Doesn't your diaphragm have holes? Your diaphragm has nothing but holes. Your diaphragm has a hole for your aorta to go through. It has a hole for your esophagus. It has a hole for your GIT. So there's a hole for your esophagus, and there's your stomach, and the rest of your intestines. So it has a hole for that. So it's very easy to think, well, if it has a hole for that, then maybe some of the GIT can go through that hole. You're absolutely right. And we call that a diaphragmatic hernia. Diaphragmatic hernia. And that will be the first hernia we'll talk about. Now, if I close my eyes again and I try to think of any other holes or canals or some weaknesses that abdominal contents can protrude through, I can think of another one. You see, in your stomach, you have your abdominal aorta, and that will bifurcate to your iliacs and turn to your femoral vessels. And those femoral vessels have to go out of your abdomen, doesn't it? Doesn't it? So it goes through something called the femoral canal. Your femoral canal will contain those arteries. We call that a femoral hernia. Femoral hernia. It's not too bad. And in the same vein, there's another canal that allows something that starts in the abdomen to, to leave the abdomen. Something that starts in the abdomen that leaves the abdomen. What could that be? That'd be your testicles. So the canal that lets these structures pass is going to be called the inguinal canal. And if you have a hernia through this, we call this the inguinal hernia. Inguinal hernia. Inguinal. And these are our three types of hernias. That's not too bad. We'll talk about the diaphragmatic hernia first. So draw our diaphragm. We say your esophagus goes through it. Here's your stomach. Well, sometimes this part, this esophagus in the top part of your stomach can move up, slide up. We call this a sliding hiatal hernia. So slide up. So slide up. And now the cardia part of your stomach and your esophageal junction is a little bit raised, is a little bit higher up. And sometimes if you look on imaging, it'll look like an hourglass. An hourglass. Hourglass. That is a sliding diaphragmatic hernia. That's not too bad. Well, you can have another type. Here's your esophagus. Here's your stomach. This is when the fundus part of your stomach protrudes up through your diaphragm. We call this paraesophageal. Para means near or next to. 
So you have a hernia next to your esophagus, paraesophageal. And this is a little bit worse. Why is it a little bit worse? Because now it's really crowded in this area. And this can strangulate very easily. So all right, strangulate, strangulate. All of these predispose you to GERD, you can imagine. That's just gonna be easier to go into your esophagus if you have these kind of defects. All right, GERD, GERD. You can see this in older patients. You can also see these in newborns. Sometimes they're born with a defect. They're born with these diaphragmatic hernias. How will that show up in a question? Well, if they're born with these diaphragmatic hernias, then all these, G all these GIT structures will move up past the diaphragm into their lungs. Yeah, and it'll compress their lungs. All right, compress lungs. And when it compresses the lungs, your lungs aren't able to develop. You get lung hypoplasia. When you get lung hypoplasia and you're born, you get <laughs> respiratory distress. Respiratory distress. So a baby with respiratory distress is born, and you're freaking out, you're freaking out, you get your stethoscope and you also take the lungs, trying to see what's going on. And you hear gastric sounds, you hear bowel sounds. What do you want them to spill out for you? This is a diaphragmatic hernia. You hear bowel sounds in the lungs, easy enough to identify. So bowel sounds in lungs. Brenda, done with diaphragmatic hernia. That was easy. That wasn't too bad. Let's talk about femoral hernia. I said that your abdominal aorta that bifurcates your iliacs, <clears throat> your femoral arteries, and there's a canal that allows your stuff to go through, called the femoral canal. And that sits right below your inguinal ligament. All right, and that's important because your femoral hernias will go through this and be below the inguinal ligament. However, your inguinal hernias will be above, will be above. And so they look very, very similar just on gross inspection. You kind of see this bulge at the area and you're like, is that inguinal, is that femoral? Well, just feel the inguinal ligament and see, is it below or below? Below or below? Did it say below or below? Is it below or above? In our case, the femoral hernia is below. And femoral hernias are more commonly seen in women. Why are they more commonly seen in women? Because the canal is larger. Their pelvises are larger. So it opens up that space for abdominal content to protrude through. So I'll say more seen in women. And then last but not least, it's smaller. The canal is smaller than probably these three. So this is another one that's prone to strangulation. You know, you have a crowded space, never a good thing. Easy to strangulate. So all these things. Now let's just talk about some, um, let's just talk about some anatomy for now. You have your, uh, should I use a different color pen? Yeah, probably make things easier. You have your femoral artery coming out, do it in red. But the, obviously that's not the only thing that can come out. You need, how about a vein? How about nerves? You know, you can't just have an artery. So that's exactly what you have. You have a nerve. Then you have your vein. And you even have lymphatics, red and brown. Everybody knows brown is the color of lymphatics. <laughs> that makes sense. So you have nerves and arteries and veins and lymphatics. And you need to know the order from lateral to medial, lateral to medial, it is nerves, arteries, vein, and lymphatic. Sometimes, sometimes we call it navel, like navel, navel, it's easy to remember. So navel, nerves, artery, vein, lymphatics, from lateral to medial, that's just some anatomy. And also, for some reason, I don't know really why, but for some reason, they want you to know there's this fascia that kind of loops around that loops around and it covers and wraps around everything but the nerve. Everything but the nerve. We call this fascia the femoral sheath. And they might ask, what does the femoral sheath not contain? It does not contain the nerve. It does not contain the nerve. Why do they care about that? Some ask why, I ask why not. So just know the femoral sheath does not contain the nerve, the femoral nerve. Many ways they ask it, many questions have gone on that too. 
They'll talk about the femoral nerve and say, is it contained in the femoral sheath? No. All right. It contains everything else. And I think that does it for femoral hernias. Let's talk about the inguinal hernia. Inguinal hernia gives a lot of people headaches, but it ain't that bad. Inguinal hernia is through inguinal canal. And to understand your inguinal hernias, you have to understand the inguinal canal. So here's your inguinal ligament. And here's your canal, a tunnel, and there's an opening in the front and an opening in the back. And this opening right here is the most external, the most superficial. All right. We call this the external or the superficial ring. Superficial ring. And it's draped by this fascia called your external spermatic fascia. And you can imagine this opening, this really superficial opening is going to be a major weak point, major weak point. Sometimes we call this weak point the inguinal triangle. I'll tell you why in a second. Major weak point. I mean, it's like a really superficial external opening. Easy for something to just kind of protrude through. So this is your external superficial opening. The rest of it is deep. This is like a 3D image. So just imagine it's a 3D image. The rest of it is deep, it goes into your belly. So it is all covered up by your belly. So it is all deep, covered up. And so all this is located more internally. And so this opening is gonna be called the internal or the deep ring. That makes sense. And one more thing you should know is that there is a artery that kind of bifurcates, bisects this canal called the inferior epigastric. So that's your inguinal canal. Let's talk about inguinal hernias. All right, so abdominal contents protruding through weakness. What's the biggest weakness? What's the biggest weak point in this whole structure? It'd be right here in the opening, right? Right here in the opening. And if it protrudes directly through that opening, we call it a direct inguinal hernia. Direct inguinal hernia. Blows right through that opening. And so it goes right through that external superficial ring. And while it goes through that, it gets draped by this fascia, this external spermatic fascia. Last but not least, if it goes right through that weakness, is that medial or lateral to the inferior epigastric artery, the thing that bifurcates it? That's medial, isn't it? Yeah, it's medial to inferior epigastric artery. That's your first type, what's your second type? Your second type is gonna to have to go through some other, other opening, some other weakness. Well, there's only one other opening, it'd be your internal. So that's not going through that, that weak point, it's not directly going through that weak point, we call this indirect inguinal hernia. Indirect inguinal hernia. And if your abdominal contents can go through the internal ring, then it can travel down that canal and go into your scrotum. That's what your canal is for. So this is when you see a patient with a hernia and you can see the scrotum just huge, just full of guts, literally full of guts. That's an indirect inguinal hernia. And as it travels down through this canal, pick up all the fascia that your normal testicles have. So it has all the spermatic fascia, all the spermatic fascia because it's going through the internal ring. Now tell me, if it goes through here, is that medial or is that lateral to the inferior epigastric? Isn't that lateral? So this is lateral to inferior epigastric artery. Now the demographic of these two is kind of important. Direct inguinal hernia is seen more in men um, older men, especially if they're straining and they're weightlifting, if they're constipated, because they can strain and then pfft, abdominal contents can blow out right through that weak point. 
Indirect inguinal hernia is seen more in kids. Kids. Normally this canal should kind of close or at least not allow guts to go through. But if they don't, then you can have that protrude out and you think, oh, this, something's open, something's patent, allowing it to go through, see more in kids. And also it's associated with hydrocele. So if this is open, you can imagine then peritoneal fluid can travel through into your testicles, not into your testicles, but into your scrotum and cause the swell up, hydrocele. All right, and yeah, I think that does it. <laughs> that does it for your hernias. That wasn't too bad, was it? Hopefully not. If it was, I'm not doing my job. So that's your hernias. Let's talk about diverticulum. The diverticulum is an outpouching of tissue. So there's tissue, and then you get a little outpouching, and that's a diverticulum. Just, just some somatics. Um, diverticulum, by definition, is an outpouching of all your tissue layers. So all your tissue layers. That's called a true diverticulum. If only a few layers outpouch, like only your mucosa or only your submucosa, we call that a false diverticulum. Okay, so just something to keep in mind. So let's talk about diverticulum in your GIT. Diverticulum. This is a disease seen more in elderly patients. Yeah, because when you're older, everything just gets a little bit more lax. Um, so it's very easy for these outpouchings to happen. And basically, and also you add in all those years of constipation, diverticulum is more of a disease of older patients. And we're all gonna get it. In fact, it's virtually all of us. So I don't even know if it's really a disease as much as it is just normal physiology. So you get these outpouchings of your gut. And it's commonly seen in your sigmoid colon, sigmoid colon. Why is it seen in your sigmoid colon? So if this is your anal canal, this is your sigmoid colon, that's where all your poo is. So <laughs> it makes sense because you're constipated, you're trying to push that through. Very easy for those outpouchings to happen. Some of it is true diverticulum, which means they have all the layers. Some of it is false, mainly false. So all right, false diverticulum. All right, due to constipation, so you don't forget. Make sure you eat your fiber. And you need to know it likes particular areas of your GIT that have phase erecta. You see in your GIT, in your tube, it gets supplied by these blood vessels called phase erecta that penetrate your tube. And where, and where the vessels penetrate through the tube is gonna be a little bit weaker, yeah? The areas where there is no penetration, then it's just kind of solid tissue, but the areas where it has to penetrate is gonna be a little bit weaker. And so often you have these outpouchings where the vessels are. All right, a little outpouching, here's a vessel. So all right, areas with vasa recta. All right, so you have all these outpouchings in your gut, usually not a problem. Usually absolutely not a problem, asymptomatic. Sometimes you can have a lot of diverticulum or diverticula. We call that diverticulosis, diverticulosis. So a ton of these. And sometimes because you're having these outpouching of the vessels, sometimes these vessels bleed and you get hematochesia. Hematochesia. Hematochesia is not blood in your stool, it's not dark stool. Hematochesia is bleeding out of your butt. Hematochesia is bright red blood, blood blood, like if you cut yourself the bright, bright red blood, you see that kind of blood in your poo. It might kind of coat your toilet, it's all over the place. So hematochesia is a big, big sign of diverticula. Yeah, and actually it's very, very common. It kind of scares the crap out of people because you see all this blood in your, in your toilet, but it's probably the most common cause of hematochesia in elderly patients. All right, so that should always be a differential. It causes painless hematochesia, painless hematochesia. These vessels just kind of bleed, all right? As you can imagine, if you have these outpouching and they're bleeding and they're kind of getting damaged, you can get an infection. We call this diverticulitis. Diverticulitis. Inflammation. And this is not gonna be asymptomatic. <laughs> All right, you have inflammation, okay? It's not gonna be asymptomatic. You're gonna have pain. What kind of pain? Where? Where? Most commonly in your sigma colon, right? So left lower quadrant. Left lower quadrant, pain, fever, all the whole nine yards. Now, if this gets inflamed, then it can perforate. It can perforate. Bust a hole right through. Perforate. 
Anytime you have a perforation in your bowels, you can pick it up right away because you do an abdominal x-ray, see air in the bowels, that's not normal. So air in bowels. Make sure you don't do a colonoscopy if there's a perforation or you can make the perforation worse. You just do imaging, CT, x-ray. So I'll say no colonoscopy if suspecting a perforation. This can flow open and connect to your bladder and make a fistula. We call this a colo, because this is your colon, vesicle, meaning related to the bladder, fistula. You get a colovesical fistula, so you can have poo coming out of your urine. That's a dead giveaway. How do you treat it? Antibiotics, fix the problem. Um, close the perforation if need be, bowel rest, all that good stuff. And that is your diverticulum of the gut. You can have diverticulum elsewhere. You can have diverticulum in your esophagus. If you are struggling to eat and you're having this kind of increased swallowing pressure, then you can have a little outpouching in your esophagus. We call that zankers. Zankers diverticulum. This is also a false diverticulum. What does that mean? That means the, the outpouching is not containing all, all your layers. So it only has a few. What do you think are gonna be some symptoms, some signs? Well, food's gonna come in and get stuck in this little outpouching and it will rot. And they get dysphagia because they can't really swallow because they have this outpouching and they get really bad breath. House houses, they go, ah! You can smell it, it's really bad. So, do I wanna say bad breath? Oh, all right, bad breath. Bad breath, dysphagia. And on barium swallow, that barium will go in and you'll see this <laughs> outpouching. That's a dead giveaway. All right, it looks, it looks kind of like a tongue. So, barium outpouching. They might ask you where the anatomy of the throat is super complex, but if they want to get really nitpicky, then it is between the crico pharyngeus muscle and the lower inferior constrictor. Remember, you have a ton of these constrictors. So this is where, just in case, just in case they're being mean, all right? So that, that is Zankers diverticulum. We have one more, that'd be your Meckles. Meckles is actually a true diverticulum. It's a true outpouching because it's not actually an outpouching. It's actually, uh, when you're an embryo, you have this, this duct, this connection between your umbilicus and the yolk sac, so you get nutrients, yeah? That duct is called the vitiline duct. Vitiline duct. Sometimes they'll be fancy and call it the umphalo mesenteric duct. You gotta know both. You gotta know both. Well, I've seen a lot of easy questions on Meckles. They might even show you a Meckles. A Meckles is very easy to re recognize. And then you look down at the answer choices and vitiline duct won't be there. But a fallow mesenteric duct will be there. Just a easy way to trick you, okay? So, gotta know them both. So you have this duct that connects to your yolk sac and eventually it should close, invalate, all right? And everything should be nice and closed. If it doesn't close, if it never closes, then you have kind of urine and gut content coming out of your umbilicus. If it closes slightly, then you can have a Meckles. All right, so you still have that kind of outpouching. All right, so it closes slightly, but not all the way, and you have this little outpouching. That's the Meckles diverticulum. Something important to know about the Meckles diverticulum, it not only contains um, intestinal tissue, but it can also contain pancreatic tissue. That's kind of cool. It can also contain gastric stomach tissue. That's also kind of cool, but it's also kind of bad because your gastric tissue makes acid, so that can just erode that and cause bleeding. Bleeding. It's one of the most common abnormalities in kids. And it causes painless GIT bleeding in kids. Very, very common. Painless bleeding in kids. How can you make sure it's Meckles? Well, then you'll have to test for Meckles. What's unique about Meckles? Something unique about Meckles is that it has pancreatic and gastric tissue where it shouldn't be. We like to test for the gastric tissue, okay? So if you see gastric tissue that's not in your stomach, then it's a Meckles. So this test is called protectinate 
study, sometimes called technetium, and that detects gastric tissue that's not in your stomach. That does it for hernias, diverticulum. Hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks.